I wish that that we could have done like a you know a better job of of really getting people to see the importance of UBI by doing a lot of other things. Like I really want to see like say a a coal miners pilot, you know, somewhere in like That'd West Virginia or something like that. It's like if if you have different types of populations in uh, in different more rural areas, like I I think it would be compelling to different groups and we need the data from my perspective like we have the data we know that it works it's just that i want people to see the importance of it themselves and see themselves in these pilot participants that's where kind of what we're what we're not doing by focusing on these like a lower or smaller subset of demographics it's, it's not reaching everybody that it could It is my pleasure to welcome back to the podcast, my guru in all things UBI, the man who came up with not left, not right, but forward, which he's wearing, if you could see him, advisor to humanity forward, Scott Santins. Welcome, Scott. Hey, Andrew. Good to see you. Yeah, we were just joking and laughing how you were the one who said to me, UBI is not left or right, it's forward in 20." 20- 17 or 2018 and i said "Ooh, that's genius <laughs> and then uh a couple of years later i i used that as a closing in one of the debates and then now it's on a t-shirt or actually multiple t-shirts as i think about it um but but you yeah got into ubi before it was a thing uh and uh, i'm sincere in saying that i just learned most all of it uh from you um you and i first met in new orleans and was that 2017 that wasn't where we first met, I don't think. I think we met for the first time in California. At the Cash um, Conference? Yeah, also yeah. Also 2017? Or, or before that even, like one of the smaller conferences before the Cash Conference. Yeah, so I uh, learned a lot from you, and then we fought it out all the way through Iowa and New Hampshire. I vividly remember hanging out with you in Iowa <laughs> in January 2020. Yeah, before everything turned upside down. Before everything turned upside down, yeah, and and then it, it's been a bit of a, you know, like a buzzsaw, uh, you know, shut down for COVID, uh, and a bunch of other things. Um, but I I wanted to talk to you about the latest and greatest with UBI, and uh, and I, I'm going to precede our discussion talking about my outlook um, for UBI and on UBI. So I run for president on it. Uh, get it the I, you know I like to think that um, we helped you me and a lot of other people in the Yang Gang helped mainstream it where before that presidential campaign it wasn't really a thing and then it became a, a thing we had some version of it during COVID with the relief checks and um, the enhanced child tax credit it gets um, mistakenly blamed for inflation later, which is, uh, you know, very upsetting and uh, frustrating and troubling. Yeah. Because everyone's like, oh, we can you send checks out and then prices go up. It's like, well, if you do the math, you realize that the checks were a very, very small component of the five trillion that went went out. I try and explain to people, it's like, look, five trillion dollars is fifteen, sixteen thousand a head. Like, do you remember sending out fifteen, sixteen thousand a head? <laughs> you know, you sent out like, you know, yeah. maybe like one or two grand a head. So what the hell happened to the other, you know, 13, 14 grand? And I uh, try and paint a picture. It's like, well, it went into the financial system. It went to big corporates. It went to states. It went to cities. went to all the stuff. So they flood the zone with money. Uh, the efficacy of cash relief actually gets borne out during this period, particularly through the enhanced child tax credit. You and I team up to start Humanity Forward in 2020 to try and advance these policies that you are – I'm right that you're still officially an advisor, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you moved from New Orleans to Washington, D.C. Yeah. Good fun. So uh, <laughs> so you and I helped kick off Humanity Forward that's still trying to advance uh, these policies in a nonpartisan, bipartisan way uh, with a focus right now on trying to revive the child tax credit. And I got to say, I was so sad and frustrated when the child tax credit was discontinued at, at the, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, the beginning of last year. I'm still pushing for 
these policies, uh, I concluded, and you, I think you agree, because you were one of the people that also put me onto this, since I tend to take your lead on a lot of things, that that the two-party system actually is part of the issue because it uh, locks things up and makes it so it's very hard to advance uh, meaningful policies that stand the test of time. And I, I became convinced that reforming our democratic structures actually precede solving very meaningful problems. Uh, so I'm still marching after the same stuff, but uh, you know, like I, I feel like there are some things we have to resolve in order to to get these things done. So that's my very lengthy preamble, uh, most of which is old news to you. So during that time, you have been tirelessly advocating for a UBI day in day out. Like, what is the latest on your front? I would also just say too, just as a little bit more uh, preamble, and maybe we'll get into it a little bit more later too, because I think it is important about any discussion about UBI when it comes to inflation, and like people blaming the stimulus checks and and everything that we did on the inflation that we're seeing. Like, uh, it, it's just kind of crazy to me too that that we were in a pandemic, <laughs> like a once in a century pandemic, like just happened. And over a million Americans are dead now because of it. And it's just crazy to me to think that we just like look at that kind of like extreme circumstance with like heavily constrained global supply lines and just all sorts of things happening. And then look at the cash as being like something we did wrong when like absolutely we need to do that. And then the other side of this too is that we, people don't see what, we didn't see because we did the cash. And so the, the the even the debate then, too, at the time was if we don't do this, if we don't get money to people, then we can actually could potentially lose, um, you know, over $10 trillion. Like the GDP uh, would have been depressed. We would have been would have taken a lot longer to get back to the where we are now, like would have been worse in the Great Recession. Like it's it's incredible that we were able to to do what we did, and I think it's absolutely smart what we did. But then we actually ignore like what we you know we're, we're not seeing like we're not in another like second Great Depression because of what we did. But people are complaining about inflation. Not that there's something you know sure inflation is is something that that impacts everybody, but really it could have been so much worse than than what we saw. So you just want to get like that out of the way too. But uh, yeah, part of this um, that I that I observed is sure enough, because of the pandemic, UBI uh, started to do, be talked about in a different way, and people started to see this as something that was important that we actually should have had before the pandemic happened. How how positively that would have impacted everything to actually have the floor underneath people. Um, you know, we saw what happened when people suddenly had to go through the unemployment insurance systems state by state and how some states were better than others. And we saw like massive food bank lines and yet the grocery stores had food like we could have it could have been so much better if we had a UBI. So I think people kind of felt that and, and see that now for themselves. Then we come out of this and people start complaining about there's a, a labor shortage that nobody wants to work anymore and they're blaming this and the stimulus and they're blaming it on the unemployment and everything. Um, but really, it's just kind of a, a, kind of amazing that we actually were able to get where we are now as far as getting the labor participation rate back up. Uh, but at the time, as it's going back up, people are looking at a labor shortage and there's coming up with all kinds of stuff. And then at that point, automation became like a joke. Like I thought it was crazy how um, like you were even like the butt of jokes of, of being like, oh, like Andrew Yang said that, you know, everyone would be out of a job and yet we can't find anyone to work. So um, like that was laughable. And so automa automation became like this joke. And then all of a sudden, I feel that all changed uh, last November uh, when, when ChatGPT launched. Like that was a total game changer in the entire conversation where suddenly people are like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, this, uh, this is serious. Like AI can do some magical things. And so suddenly we're in this world where AI is just like, it's right there. It's like, it's happening as we see it. It's happening in real time in a way that, you know, people were making fun of even just, you know, a year ago. 
And well, now well, one of the are. things I find frustrating, Scott, is like people are like, what do you mean automation? Like people can't find people to work. And it's like, well, you know, those two things actually can happen at the same time. Like, you know, companies can be investing yeah. gajillions of dollars in automating uh, various roles. And you have a hard time getting people to show up for job X or job Y, particularly if those jobs are, frankly, punitive or undercompensated or whatever the heck the, the situation is. So um, I agree with you that the conversation definitely changed when ChatGPT came online. Everyone was like, wait a minute. Uh, this thing can do what I do. <laughs> you know, th- th- this thing... This thing scores an 88th percentile on the bar exam. It's like better than, you know, most attorneys probably manage. So for me, the trend has just been ongoing the whole time. I mean, even during COVID, when people were sent home, I I saw one survey that said that almost half of companies said they were investing more in automation. And by the way, if you're working remotely, you are one step easier to automate. You know, it's Mm. like uh, you're essentially setting your work in. And, And to your point, it's just going to get stronger and faster. I saw a tweet you put out saying, hey, I thought that maybe we could get UBI up before AI came and got us all, but now it's too late. <laughs> and yeah. I, I did not disagree with your estimation. <laughs> I, I, do, I do think it's changed the conversation. I would love to hear like, some more of what, what you've been seeing on that front. Um, so November happens, ChatGPT comes online, it gets better in March. And then now is everyone saying like, huh, maybe we should revisit UBI? Like what's the tenor? So it, like... For for years now, I, I've made a point of just regularly kind of tracking what people are saying about basic income on, on Twitter. And um, yeah, there was like, you know, during the pandemic, it was pandemic stuff. And uh, then there was that kind of like a dead zone where it kind of dropped off with inflation rising and automation not being something we cared about. ChatGPT comes out. And now it, I would say since then, there's just uh, like a growing conversation uh, just all sorts of people on on Twitter, like I know that I didn't notice them before because I also make a point of trying to follow anyone who is like speaking favorably about basic income. Um, so I kind of like can keep track of, oh, this is a person is new or not and in, in talking about it. That's and... one reason we love you, Scott. You freaking <laughs> catalog all things UBI related. Yeah. And so recently, I've just there's so many new people that people I hadn't already been following speaking favorably about, about, about basic income, and a lot of this is just the you know, automation argument. Like, it'll be in response to someone talking about automation, something talking about ChatGPT or or MidJourney or you know some other AI tool that's out there, and people will be like, "Oh, this is." You know, this is crazy. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. And then there's just, you know, so many often, so many times there's someone in the replies saying, we're going to need to do universal basic income. And so it's really just part and parcel of this conversation uh, in a way that it wasn't prior to the pandemic. So, you know, I had gotten into the to UBI even originally through the automation argument back in 2013. And that was that kind of kicked off this kind of like new wave of interest in, in basic income. Um, but even then, like people were talking about automation, but they weren't talking about basic income. I was trying to inject that into the conversation. <laughs> well done, And Scott. you wrote a book about it, trying to inject that of the conversation. So like here we are both trying to get people to connect automation with basic income. And now it's on like autopilot now. Like people who are talking about automation and talking about what's going on, that UBI is part of the conversation. You guys already know all about ExpressVPN. I've talked before about why they are the go-to service for protecting your online activity. Big tech should not be snooping on us and profiting from what we do in our private time. ExpressVPN can also help Access content, including thousands of Netflix shows that might be available in another market. You just beam in, encrypted, surreptitiously, and you can be a UK user. And all of a sudden, all that fun BBC content can be yours. I could go on and on about ExpressVPN. It's the VPN that I trust, and I'm not surprised that CNET, Wired, and others have rated it number one. Visit expressvpn.com slash yang right now and get three extra months of their service for free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash yang. Expressvpn.com slash yang to learn more. (laughs) 
So now people are into, okay, we're definitely going to automate away a significant number of jobs. And then they also think, well, we're going to need UBI. Uh, so what, what should we do next? Uh, I, I'm, I had a conversation with a member of Congress yesterday, and she was favorable on uh, UBI and uh, the, the child tax credit and some other things. And one of the issues that we discussed was that uh, Mayors for a Guaranteed Income organization got started in 2020. Um, and I want to say the vast majority of the mayors and mayor, mayors for a guaranteed income are uh, Democrats, maybe all of them actually, uh, and not them, just Democrats, yeah. but also uh, Democrats of color, uh, often black. It's thrilling that there are so many basic income pilots and trials being rolled out uh, around the country. It, yeah, so a couple of things uh, along those lines. First, yeah, I would I, I would say that uh, like it was a great thing that uh, mayors for guaranteed income formed and you know over a, a hundred mayors uh, so far have, have signed on to this and uh, i believe um, over uh, i think 50 now are um, have either been done already or are active or in the planning stages that's great one thing i i feel that uh, that i wish would have been more part of this was kind of contextualizing UBI more through these. So like one way of, um, I think it's important to look at these pilots is, you know, people will look at this and go, well, that's not universal. That's not testing universality. That's testing like some specific demographic. Like, so maybe it's um, uh, kids at exiting foster care or, um, you know, pregnant mothers. A very worthy population. Yeah. Like there's, there's some, there's some various populations out there um, artists, uh, just so many others. And if you, if you look at this and say, okay, if there was a universal basic income, then all artists would get it. And so how would that impact artists? So then if you look at just a subset and look at, you know, 2000 artists, then you're actually able to see, you know, what would be the impact of UBI on that group? And then so hopefully all artists after seeing this can see, oh, this is how much of a benefit it would have to me. And then you can build up these constituencies, which each, each of these pilots, uh, that's how like I wish that would have gone to really like try to get all sorts of different demographics and not to repeat the same one in another place, but really try to, to do different things all over. Unfortunately, um, that's not the what happened. And some cities are even just like say boosting their earned income tax credit or something like that, where, you know, that already exists. It's nothing new. It's just like utilizing this excitement um, for basic income pilots uh, to just like channel funds through existing mechanisms. And so uh, on that, like I'm disappointed in, in that way about those kinds of, of things. I wish that that we could have done like a you know a better job of of really getting people to see the importance of UBI by doing a lot of other things. Like I really want to see like say a a coal miners pilot you know somewhere in like That'd West Virginia or something like that. It's like if if you have different types of populations in uh, in different more rural areas, like I I think it would be compelling to different groups, and we need the data. Yeah, and I would say we need those stories. Uh, like from my perspective, like we have the data, we know that it works. It's just that I want people to see the importance of it themselves and see themselves in these pilot participants. And um, I think I think that's where kind of what we're what we're not doing is um, by focusing on these like a lower or smaller s subset of demographics. It's it's not reaching everybody that it could. Um, so. That's one thing. I, on a more, uh, also a kind of a depressing point or a frustration point for me, is uh, this is another result of the pandemic and everything that we saw. So as the pandemic happens, you see this this boost in uh, anti-vaccination uh, and and conspiracy groups and like even just conspiracy theories in general kind of like get a boost and they spread. Uh, you know, in a way that, you know, I've never seen before. Uh, it's just kind of like, I think social media is, is especially designed uh, uh, to amplify this kind of stuff. And so um, as part of this, there's um, 
I, I, I think the the origin point of this was the the freedom convoy in Canada, and uh, when when uh, the Prime Minister Trudeau there in Canada uh, responded to the convoy and how that they were uh, there in Ottawa and and just blocking everything and preventing um, things from happening there and not leaving, then um, he took actions there that just really inflamed um, this whole community. And as a result of that, um, UBI is now something that a lot of people in this conspiracy theory world now fear. Uh, and they, they see it as a tool of control. Um, you know, they say that, oh, um, you know, it, it's, it's the you know, World Economic Forum and, and Klaus Schwab wants to control everything. He's the, the real world leader. And uh, he wants to like trick you into being under his control by having a basic income. Well, what, what's <laughs> funny, man, is if, if, if you send me money, it, it probably makes me free or not less free, but go on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so a lot of the times I'll say, do you think like seniors on social security are less free? Um, and of course not like seniors in social security, they're the ones who the government responds to, like they vote <laughs> yeah, in yeah, numbers. They're the most important they constituency out there. Right. Right. And so it, it like, the, I think these, they see basic income and they say, oh, you're supported by the government and therefore the government can take it away from you and, and utilize that as a means of control. And even though that's exactly how welfare works let's you know that's something that's controlled and conditional but basic income is not that it's universal and unconditional but they're kind of like afraid of this say fake ubi this like this ubi that isn't and um and now they're saying like oh it's going to be attached to cbdc's uh cbdc's are weak programmable money so the government will prevent you from buying what you actually want to buy uh you know they're getting rid of cash like all these things, and UBI is right up in there. Uh, so it's like if if you talk to somebody who is say anti World Economic Forum, uh, they're anti, um, uh, they're also anti fifteen minute cities. They're anti vaccine. They're anti bug eating, which they they think that like the like Klaus Schwab and the elites of the world want us to want to force us all to eat bugs instead of hamburgers. Like there's some really weird stuff out there. But UBI is is part of it, and that's been really frustrating to see. So I wouldn't say that UBI has become polarized, but I would say that there is a constituency that's mostly on the right um, that believes in this stuff and therefore has come to see UBI as this, like, evil thing. And, yeah, that's, that's, that's very frustrating me to, to have seen that be one of the outcomes of uh, the pandemic. Hey, YouTube, glad you're enjoying the podcast. If you really like it, hit subscribe, and then YouTube will notify you every time we have a bang-up new guest. Thank you. When you talk about some of the, the these more negative sentiments, I feel like people have been in a bad mood, a funk, uh, mistrustful for oh approximately two and a half years now <laughs> something, something like that <laughs> they're, and they're, before well, <laughs> well you know yeah i mean there's been this uh, giant plummeting in institutional trust and capacities and, and it's been in, i mean it's been like bizarre uh i i felt it too at times if you had a more functional system so we're talking about automation as one one topic one of the things that makes me incredibly frustrated is that let's say that ChatGPT does eat a few million jobs in the next year, uh, two years, whatever the time frame is. How would we even know at this point? You know what I mean? Like, like, <laughs> like, it, w would there be this media consensus saying, like, "Yup, that happened." You know, like we used to have X million office workers, and now we don't. Like, uh, this thing's real. Time for the government to do something. Uh, like that entire set of uh, steps that you might imagine would happen in a more functional system. Now, even I don't believe would happen. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, I'm continuously looking at economic data trying to parse. It's like, what is happening out there? 
uh, and you you have the party in power saying like things are great, and then the party out of power being like things are terrible, and folks yeah. are responding to those arguments really based upon which side they favor. Um, you know, if you had let's say nonpartisan primaries and ranked choice voting, and then everyone had to like actually deliver or lose their jobs, as opposed to now it's like you know I can deliver, I cannot deliver, it doesn't really matter. As long as I try and keep the ten to twelve percent of the primary voters happiest, <laughs> then you know, then yeah, the problems don't really matter. That like the automation doesn't matter. It's like you know, uh, really the, the the question is how our political system uh, will respond in real life. Uh, and I, I confess, you know, like my, my optimism about that is lower than it might have been um, back in twenty eighteen or twenty nineteen. Uh, no, mine's plummeted. <laughs> I'm so glad like, to hear you say uh, that, Scott. I mean, I'm not because it's super upsetting. No, but uh, but also I see you as extraordinarily lucid. Uh, you know, you're like lucid, rational, and practical. Things that I imagine myself to be on good days, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, how are we going to get this shit done in real life? And yeah, like you're, you're like looking at it. I mean, hell, you even moved to D.C. to help try and make this shit happen. And, yeah. and, and your faith in... These institutions being rational, uh, it sounds like has gone the same direction mine has. Yeah, and it's and it's not only the like it's not only let's say the American institutions. I I think it's even just an issue you know with with just government itself. So even if we had like a highly reactive government, I I think that we're looking at a situation where a, you know a highly effective government has to be highly effective in trying to figure out just how far ahead of the player to throw the football in order to, you know, get the touchdown. Like technology is, is happening, you know, AI is happening so quickly uh, that, you know, even, even if you're in it and you're like focused on it and um, you, you can, you can still just be, uh, just taken aback by how quickly it's happening. Um, yeah. I mean, like technologists I are freaking out about how fast yeah. it's happening. They're like, no so, way. The, the the rate of paper publication right now is is already up to four thousand papers a month, and this is growing it, it, at a logarithmic scale. It's just a straight line going up, uh, but at a, at a normal scale, it's just you know you're looking at the hockey puck. But even just like trying the the process of like all right, what are all the things that are happening? What is the state of the art right now? And then suddenly something new happens, and then something new happens again. Uh, another new study. And it, that's just one person, me, trying to keep up on everything. So if if one person is having a hard time, how the heck do you like actually get members of Congress to be up to speed on this? Like even if they had if each and this is like your full time staff pursuit. member. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Right. Like they would each have to have one full time AI staff member whose entire job is to stay up to date. And then they would try to let's say get them up to speed, maybe like a half hour a day or something. Uh, but even then, they're not going to be fully up to date because uh, of the difficulty of doing that. And then how do you actually legislate this kind of stuff? Like you, there's so many unknowns and the unknowns are constantly shifting. And so, yeah, we're just in this situation where I'm just thinking, oh, my gosh, like we so desperately need UBI to be in place already just to handle all these changes. And just people have no idea. And they're they're not going to get it until like even when things are going so quickly and you know it's even more important then i don't know when they're actually going to figure this out um but i definitely have no hope in them doing this before like people have a lot of issues you know there's going to be you know i i think maybe something like we saw before like during the pandemic you know like uh, just kind of this feeling of anarchy is, as people, um, you know, get really upset and, and go out in the streets and stuff. Like, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I'm an optimist at heart, but, uh, I, I just think that, like I said, and like you mentioned earlier, it's too late. And, uh, the question is what can we possibly do now, um, to, to do this as, as, as quickly as possible and to do everything else that we need to do about AI. Indeed, my friend. So I'm on the uh, the same wavelength. I will say that um, according to uh, my wife, who's uh, an excellent authority on these things, she said that, hey, if someone were to run around um, championing UBI on the presidential trail, she was like, they would do really well because at this point, there's so many Americans who are like, oh, we actually could do that. 
uh, <laughs> you know, like I, I quite liked it. <laughs> I mean, my, yeah. my, my wife has very good instincts. Like I've, I haven't seen any of the latest numbers to that effect. Um, but I, I do think that there's a lot of pessimism, a lot of confusion around the inflation uh, phenomenon. Um, I also think um, this economy is likely to tip into recession sometime this next um, number of months. And, and so in many ways, like I'm starting to project forward being like, OK, well, you know, after things uh, head south, like there still will be a rebuild of some kind. Um, you know, one thing I'm optimistic about with the forward party is like people are going to be like, well, uh, you know, it's time for something new. Like, what the heck do I do? And, you know, if you're busy building something new, then people might be attracted to it. Um, I, I also have a belief that there's going to be a surge in interest in the forward party as soon as people realize that their choices might be Joe Biden and Donald Trump again. <laughs> that, that they'll be like, wait a minute. Like, this doesn't seem very, uh, very, very functional, uh, very smart. I'm not, not, not that excited about that. It's like, wait, what, what was Yang doing? I think Yang was trying to, to, to do something that maybe makes this um, yeah. l less carved in stone. Um, so, I, I, I'm, so I'm with you on being pessimistic you know, I'm with you. One, I'd like, I consider myself an optimistic fellow and a yeah. can do fellow. I mean, I, you know, I, I, like what you've done, holy right. shit. We got to do what we can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what you've done is like epic. I mean, you were like, hey, I want to write about UBI. Maybe I should get myself a UBI. <laughs> hey, guys, you want to get me a UBI so I can write about UBI? <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> hey, UBI is awesome. I'm like a living, walking example. I mean, that, that's a very can do positive uh, spirit. Uh, you know, at the, at the same time, uh, you know, it's like, like, uh, I, I'm also seeing the same things you're seeing and being like, wow, this system doesn't really care. <laughs> this system doesn't really care so much about whatever the heck is happening to... Yeah, everything gets transformed into partisan talking points. And, you know, I'm, I'm not looking forward to AI being transformed into a partisan matter either. Like, fortunately, right now, it's not. So it's really interesting that there's at least one thing that people don't know what side to be on right now and what that side is and how to talk about it. Because, you know, the politicians, again, they're so far behind when it comes to AI that they don't even know how to talk about it in terms of partisanship. But that's coming. And, you know, I, I really uh, am not excited about when that's when that comes and, and how that plays out. This podcast is sponsored by Helix Sleep. Having a good mattress has always struck me as one of the best investments you can make because you spend a lot of time on that mattress and having a healthy night's sleep gives you energy for the day, keeps you healthy, makes you capable of doing all the things you want to do. Why would you sleep on a mattress that's made for someone other than you, especially in 2023? With Helix Sleep, you can take a personalized quiz, get one of their 14 unique mattresses sent right to your door, have a 100-night trial, and a 10-plus year warranty. Yeah, they have that much confidence in their products, in part because they're manufactured right here in the USA, and it's the number one mattress picked by GQ and Wired Magazine. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash yang. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. If someone wants to follow you and support you um, on your explorations, uh, how can they best do so? And what do you what do you feel your time doing aside from boning up on all things AI and then being pushed out of date like days later? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was I recommend that people follow me on on Twitter. That's my my main uh, location, and um, I have a pin thread there of, of evidence that I always recommend people check out. Uh, you know, my my site scottsanson's dot com. I got a UBI FAQ there to help people learn about basic income. And yeah, my Patreon, patreon.com slash Scott Santons, uh, people can help with that. But um, the thing that, that uh, like one of the things I've been working on um, lately is, uh, I, I think this is important. This goes into what we were just talking about as far as, um, you know, this, what do we do? And if, if government isn't, isn't doing what it needs to do, I feel that we just need to get UBI going. So uh, I think... Uh, Comingle is a, is a platform that I think is is uh, potentially key 
to this. So I, I've been focusing more on hopefully trying to get that off the ground. Uh, Commingle is a is a platform where essentially people would sign up and self impose a seven percent uh, flat tax on themselves, and then that would result in a in a in a full UBI that's equal for every participant. And so I think that that's a you know a real demonstration of uh, you know people being uh, you know, net recipients and net payers. And, um, you know, cause people go, oh, well, you know, if they hear about basic income, why does Bill Gates get a basic income too? Without understanding that, well, Bill Gates is going to be paying a lot more into UBI than he is getting out of it. It's just like this really, this really, um, great way of, of instead of means testing and phasing out just naturally, uh, through the tax system, through just the the math of it all, having it it such that you know the those who receive the most have the lowest incomes, and those who um, who who pay in the most, you know, are your your net are net payers, and not net recipients. And um, like I, I like I want that kind of tool. Like I want to be able to actually put my money where my mouth is and say I want to donate. You know. Uh, a, a net impact of say whatever it is two hundred dollars a month or something that would go to hopefully tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people in small incre- increments across everybody, and that tool doesn't really exist yet. And so um, it's in uh, it can exist and it's in you know alpha stage right now. It's not just vaporware, uh, but I think that tools like that, like tools that actually just go okay, technology is here. We need to do something about it, and let's just use technology. Let's just try to actually get these things going, and hopefully if you can get some kind of small basic income to people, some kind of increased economic inse- economic security to people, then that will empower them and enable them, hopefully tone down a little bit of the insecurity and stress that's leading to these other issues, and hopefully you know open people's minds and, and open the you know the door to legislation by people actually understanding it and being more empowered by it. So that's even what I'm thinking that we need to do at this point is just like figure out ways of directly doing this in order to spark what needs to be done at a larger level. I love it, Scott. We can't wait around uh, for government to get its act together. Uh, Let's just try and take shots on goal and solve problems ourselves. Uh, It actually... Uh, reminds me of a meeting I had this week with this incredible entrepreneur who's working on a data rights um, uh, plan and startup that I think could actually work in the real world where it's like no one's waiting around. Uh, you know, if you said, hey, like, what what do I think the prospects are of uh, the government making it so that we have uh, agency over our own data and maybe even get paid? I'd be like, you know, in the U.S., like, you know, pretty, pretty slim. But this guy is like, oh, I th- I've got a plan to make it happen. And mm-hmm. I heard his plan. I was like, that plan's really good. <laughs> like, like I'm, I'm gonna... So it, it's, it's similar to what you're saying. It's like, look, you know, maybe there are solutions that can be built uh, independent of policy because, yeah. you know, I mean, like uh, that, that's what we should be doing. And these solutions need to help illustrate the arguments to like really make them real for people. So even uh, like when it comes to an AI dividend utilizing the data, uh, like it's interesting to see this kind of conversation unfold the way it's been where like I've been making the argument that, uh, especially recently that, Hey, when it comes to large language models, you know, basically the internet trained all these things. And that was me even like, um, you, know, you can ask GPT four about me and, and it'll know me and based on my writing and I can actually, you know, write like me based on my writing because it's been trained on my work. And so, like, I'm happy about that. Like, I'm glad that I actually had a bunch of stuff out there You're on the You're glad there's a smidgen of Scott Santons <laughs> right. in the AI. There's a little slice of me. You know, there's in, a bigger uh, slice GPT. of you than there is of most of us, Scott, because <laughs> you've been putting a lot of stuff out there. This yeah. thing is one billionth Scott and one trillionth the rest of us. And so, yeah, from from that perspective, like I'm happy that like my my voice, my work is part of this, and and it can. But reach shouldn't you that get way. one billionth of the of the value? Right. But and it's just saying that that all of us contributed to this. All of us through all of our writing and and texts and 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 tweets and everything that we've done has helped to make this possible. 
and we should we should your see tweets a dividend made this from possible. It. <laughs> <laughs> All of our ridiculous tweets the, the helped to train people. AI to like learn, you know, how to predict the next word, you know, based on everything that we've done. So it, it's been interesting. To, this is just like recently, just in the last like let's say week or so, you've seen like a lot of companies. Um, starting to like even clamp down on their API usage and, and saying, you know, I don't, we don't want um, these large models to actually be using our data anymore. You should pay us kind of thing. Nice. And so there's like these walls coming up. And so, you know, on the one hand, you can think, well, okay, um, put up those walls in and make sure that your users, you know, get the money for it. But we all know that's not going to happen. <laughs> like these walls, if they do that, they're just going to make sure that the company itself gets the money. It's going to help profits. It's going to help shareholders. It's not going to go down to the users. Users still don't get anything. And I think that it's important to communicate UBI as an AI dividend, you know, in this, uh, where we are now, like, I think part of the barrier to UBI is people thinking, you know, oh, like people are going to be left with nothing uh, except for this like poverty floor level, you know, basic income, and that's all that they'll get. And, you know, speaking of it as a dividend, as you did in your campaign, you know, gets people to see that, you know, people think of a dividend as the better the company does, the better I do. And so, you know, if you have a, a, like a true dividend, let's say it's tied to GDP per capita, as productivity increases, as AI is able to become more and more capable, then the floor rises. And that floor uh, can be seen as something that people, you know, deserve, that it's earned. It's an earned dividend. It's not welfare. It's not something that somehow limits them. It's something that is supplementary to everything else that they do and is enabling everything that they do. And... Um, continues to increase as the, the nation improves. It's a dividend on freedom, my friend. I am pumped to announce that I have a novel coming out on September 12th, The Last Election. It's a political thriller co-written with my friend Stephen Marsh, who wrote the book, The Next Civil War. If you listen to this podcast, Stephen's been a repeat guest. Stephen and I became friends and thought we should collaborate on a way to scare the shit out of people, but also entertain them with a story of what could happen in this upcoming election or the election thereafter. Do check it out at andrewyang.com slash books. And there's a special discount code last election that you can use for 30% off at the publisher's website. I'll be talking more about this book, but I'm so pumped to get this out into the world. Last election coming your way. Well, one, one personal question I have for you is you've been living in DC for a number of months now. How is it? Like, what's the jam? I have never lived in D.C. Uh, <laughs> and, like, do you hang out at these events at night and then people are like, I do this, I do this. And you're like, I'm like, you know, like uh, the walking uh, example of universal basic income. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> what, what, what's your social life like? What's the vibe like? Um, is it great? Is it terrible? Is it somewhere in between? You know, I, I really wouldn't say that uh, that my experience is, is all that different uh, because, again, I, I, I'm very much a remote worker. You know, <laughs> from my perspective, it, like I, I really I moved here because I f I feel that we're entering kind of like the end game part of UBI, where you know at some point, hopefully in the next like five years or something, that we'll actually get something passed that looks like a UBI, and I think that that Windows definitely has the potential to open in, um, you know, after the next election. Uh, we're going to have, you know, first of all, who knows what, how AI is going to advance between now and true, November man. 2024. Yeah, it's an eternity so, in AI terms. Right. Like, for all we know, let's say GPT-6 or 7 comes out. It was like the October surprise. And it, what does that mean uh, for even that election? And then so... People are going to be a lot more interested in AI and in economic security, you know, programs like UBI, like the child allowance, um, trying to figure out, you know, what do we do? And then also during that time, you've got um, 
the Trump tax credits expiring. And so you're going to have to do stuff that involves uh, the tax code and, um, and, and that combination of a need to actually um, reform the tax code in another new big way combined with um, hopefully calls for responses to AI and hopefully that being UBI, then a window can potentially exist. And uh, I just want to be here for it, <laughs> to, to, to do what I can um, when, the, when the opportunities arise. Well, you're doing uh, everything possible every single day, my friend. Uh, uh, glad to be on this journey alongside you, and hopefully we will have that celebratory signing uh, in, in D.C. upcoming. The uh, stepping stone I can see that's within grasp, um, uh, really, maybe even before 2024, um, is this uh, enhanced child tax credit revival. Uh, and when people uh, ask me about UBI and the data, I say, hey, what if I were to tell you that we gave like $93 billion to a few million families around the U.S. and their mental health improved and their educational outcomes improved? And we just did this literally, you know, like, you yeah. know, years ago. It's like, you know, I mean, to, to your point, it's like we have plenty of data that this would be tremendous. And most yeah. people don't think of that child tax credit as UBI, but um, you and I both know it's very much a, an enormous anti-poverty measure. Uh, and uh, I, I think that can be something we should be uh, aiming towards because the people love it, economists love it, the data love it. Uh, a lot of legislators I talk to love it as well, um, including some folks who are, you know, not uh, um, ideologically like what, you know, where you'd expect. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, families were on average receiving what, $428 a month. And, you know, that was, that was a floor for them. And, you know, it was just, there's so many multiple papers written about this, you know, went to 90% of, of kids in the U S like the effects were just amazing to see. And then even like when they canceled it or when it expired and didn't re restore it, um, it was just, you know, we actually watched the parental employment rate go down. You know, so here we are, like the conversation is, oh, oh, we can't give money to people or else they'll stop working. And it's like, well, that's not what we saw. And then, you know, you've got people going, oh, well, you know, that's only because it lasted for six months. But if it lasted for longer than that, then that's not the case. And it's like, well, the same thing is in Canada and they've had it for years and it's great up there. So like, you know, the evidence is, is so strong for people who actually look at it and even base their decisions on evidence. But I feel the, the anecdotes, you know, that's, you've got your, your welfare queen mythology. You've got your, oh, I know one person who did this. Uh, or only caring about one person, like, oh, if only one person uses their basic income, you know, to start drinking or doing drugs, then that's bad. And it's like, well, but the evidence shows that overall uh, drug use and alcohol use goes down. So isn't that what we want? Like, do, um, so we've got like this kind of um, this this anecdotal evidence problem. And um, so I think a key to that is being able to really richly and powerfully tell these stories. So like another project I'm excited about uh, to getting off the ground is uh, uh, bootstraps. And so this was a uh, two and a half year basic income uh, program that um, was filmed um, over that time. So there's like a thousand hours of footage of, of 21 people living with a basic income both before and during the pandemic. And the demographics are just very diverse amount of people, including a, a Southern conservative Trump supporter. And to be able to like see these stories and see how it impacted them, I think is just really powerful. And we need to get those kinds of stories out there for people to connect with. And I think that's one of the things that that's missing are these really powerful can, stories. Can people like, see that bootstraps film now? No, it's uh, in post uh, production right now. Very exciting, uh, red yeah. carpet, UBI movie. <laughs> so ho hopefully it'll end up being on like you know your Netflix or HBO or or something. I um, like it, but I think that's the kind of thing that people need to see. Like when Made came out on Netflix, that was a great show, and I think people um, kind of gained a better understanding of you know what it's like for a a single mother. 
uh, fleeing uh, household, you know, domestic abuse, uh, and to even trying to get a job and going through the welfare system, and then like jumping through those bureaucratic hoops and being told, yeah, that was you well know, done. like all that stuff. It was it was great. We, we need stories like that that people can connect to. Yeah, sometimes um, art can move the culture in a positive direction. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking a shot or two at, in that direction. I've got this political thriller coming out in September uh, that's oh, yeah, meant I to paint a that. picture about... i got to send you the manuscript, bro. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just meant it. to paint a picture about what our, <laughs> you know, what our last election could look like, <laughs> I, I guess. But unfortunately, that's like not the very distant future anymore as a possibility. Uh, well, Scott, uh, so thrilled to, to have uh, this opportunity to pick your brain a little bit more, uh, learn a lot from you every single time. If we get to UBI, you're going to be one of the big reasons why. Um, and I say that as a public figure that is commonly associated with UBI, but I'm also the first to say it's like, look, guys, like UBI is definitely not my idea. I mean, it was like MLK, Thomas Paine. And I don't always say Scott Santons because, you know, that, that it's like doesn't you know, try to fit that historical figure. <laughs> <laughs> that thing. But people in the know know it's Scott Santons. I um, ho- hope you and Katie are, are great down in D.C. and that I get to see you soon. Thanks. And it, one other thing, too, I, I wanted uh, to, to mention to you. Oh, Titus wants to show up. Uh, oh, good. Titus just turned six um, yesterday. So really? Wow. And uh, I guess one other thing, too, before I go is uh, I don't know if you noticed uh, the press release that uh, the Gerald Huff Fund for Humanities put out yesterday that was uh, our response to the um, open letter uh, th- that you signed for the pause in AI, and that was uh, our response to saying, you know, as part of any pause, that UBI needs to be part of this conversation. Like, this is just such an important element of this. Um, you know, we should focus on on responsible AI development and, you know, everything that goes along with the other dangers. But we absolutely have to keep an eye on the ball as far as um, the labor market transformation and what's going to happen to people's uh, economic security. And that UBI is just a, a foundation and element for, for everything that we're going to see. I love it. I certainly hope that uh, we can ad- advance UBI uh, as really the only logical response <laughs> to, to AI <laughs> becoming smarter and more powerful uh, every single day. Oh, and uh, th- another thing I think that you would enjoy, too, is uh, I don't know if you, you noticed, uh, saw this yet, but it's uh, uh, a Japanese translation of my book. Uh, that, that I'm pretty excited about. Congratulations, like, that came out Scott. Yeah, You're an yeah. international author now, <laughs> multiple languages. I thought it was so cool. You know, there's original illustrations for it, and, and it just looks really neat. So I, I hope that it does well in Japan. And, uh, you know, if other countries are out there listening, uh, South Korea looking at you, uh, yeah, South Korea uh, would Nordic be good nations. Okay. <laughs> um, but for anyone, go to scottsantins.com, uh, S-A-N-T-E-N-S, uh, for all of Scott's writings and wisdom, and buy his book, scottsantons.com. Thanks, yeah, and uh, got a really exciting project coming up. Can't talk about that one yet, but just so people know that there is something uh, I'm cooking up that I'm hoping to uh, be able to announce in the next couple months. Well, thanks so much for coming on. See you soon, my friend. Scott Santons at scottsantons.com. Thanks, good to see you again, Andrew. Andrew.